Welcome back to all our attendees. Uh, before I announce the next speaker, I would like to announce about the contest again. Please do pay attention to all the speaking uh, sessions so that you can answer the questions and win those gifts. Uh, announcing our next speaker, Mr. Guy Gerritz, Regional Energy Industry Sales Leader for the European Middle East Africa region as, at NVIDIA. Speaking on today's topic will be the power of HPC computing. Over to you, Mr. Guy. Thank you very much, uh, Melvin. Uh, I'm Guy Gerrit. So I, I'd like to talk about high performance computing, specifically from the energy perspective, which is the one I'm responsible for. And also from the NVIDIA perspective, which uh, is, of course, uh, where I'm uh, uh, looking at uh, this, this whole thing. But uh, first of all, if, for those who maybe don't know NVIDIA very well, uh, we are really about three things. Uh, the base of the company is computer graphics, and that was originally, uh, the company was formed to provide a graphics card for PC games. So that is a very large volume business, and that has provided us not only with a secure base financially, but also a very high level of um, technical uh, skill to to put that into the professional context. So not only for, for gamers, but also used for professional visualization. Uh, the actual card is essentially an array processor and it's also been adapted for use in high performance computing. And I think that's a very important point about the architecture. It is pretty much the same architecture used but for graphics, for high performance computing, and in the last few years, also for artificial intelligence. In fact, the whole current wave of artificial intelligence came about uh, as a result of a contest, an academic contest. The University of Toronto won it uh, with a consumer GeForce card from NVIDIA uh, to uh, win the ImageNet challenge. Uh, so that has meant this, this huge upsurge of interest and activity in artificial intelligence. As I hope I can show, these are all very much um, bound up together. So what we provide is essentially a whole platform. The GPU itself, the hardware, this is the, a large array processor with 5,000, 6,000 cores. And above it, we have built up a whole uh, layer of software. So virtualization layers, different libraries for different purposes, uh, the frameworks commonly used by the artificial intelligence community, and at the top, uh, the customer's use cases and applications. And in my, my particular job is that of energy, which is uh, oil and gas and the power industries in particular. And so it's uh, not simply a matter of providing exotic hardware to run applications faster. Uh, a whole large uh, set of, it's a whole envir environment of developer tools is needed. And that is what we have been spending most of our time working on. Um, since the beginning. As far as the energy business is concerned, we, we see four things. The first thing is not only the requirement for performance in subsurface imaging and simulation, but also the scaling of that. So not only to do it faster, but to do it on much bigger machines with much larger amounts of data. The second thing, especially now, is the need to collaborate between uh, people who are working remotely, at the same time ensuring that data is firstly secure, kept in a secure place, and is not being shared all around the network, which is both inefficient and insecure. The third thing, as everybody knows, um, we are in an energy transition where uh, we are trying to reduce the CO2 emissions uh, by changing the energy mix in favor of more use of renewables and other zero carbon methods of generating energy, particularly electricity. And the final thing is the digital transformation using data um, and machine learning and deep learning techniques. So in video, we've been involved in the uh, oil and gas industry, the energy industry for quite some time, certainly even before I joined Eight years ago, we were working on seismic imaging codes using GPUs, as well as all the uh, geoscience uh, graphical codes, which have been standard in the industry for, for a couple of decades. Uh, 
going into AI, that has opened up a lot of new areas uh, to to exploit uh, for areas such as uh, simulations for trading, uh, for improving logistics, uh, for inspection, for predictive maintenance, all the way down from upstream to midstream and downstream in the oil and gas industry. And then there is the whole area of the energy transition where solar, wind, geothermal, even nuclear, these are now being looked at very seriously to reduce the dependence on, on simply burning hydrocarbons. And we are now involved in all of that activity. So it's really about three things for us. One, we work with customer codes for their high performance computing applications. And these have been largely in the area of seismic imaging, uh, advanced techniques which were known about before, but they were not much used because of the computational expense. They needed very big machines, very expensive machines in order to, to make use of them. And over time, that became more a question of using cheap processors, many of them built into clusters. Uh, because of Moore's law, that has started to tail off as a means of scaling up, and the use of GPUs has started to come in as we are able to provide a very large number of cores to improve performance and scalability. The other two things have more to do with creating a secure environment in terms of a private hybrid or, or public cloud, and that also means the use of interactive graphics, uh, what, which are able to access the data which has been produced by high performance computing. And the final thing is to develop the use cases of AI and the partners needed for this particular industry. So this is just an, some examples of uh, companies that we are working with. Some of these are oil and gas companies, some are power industry companies, and the two are rather distinct in some ways. Uh, oil and gas is, a, is clearly an industry, uh, the power industry more of a service, but of course they overlap a great deal in, the, in that they both generate and distribute energy. Um, what I wanted to do is a, is a first use case, and it is the reason why uh, GPUs became used in high performance computing within the oil and gas industry is because of seismic imaging. And I'm showing you this particular animation as this is a particular case of a computationally very expensive technique that was not much used before uh, until GPUs were made to use to, to run these things. Essentially, these provided a four to five times speed up on these codes, which is an enormous improvement uh, as far as productivity is concerned. The technique itself uh, provides much higher quality and clearer images uh, in seismic data. So exploration success is um, improved by the use of these advanced techniques, which were previously not used much as they were, they just required too much uh, computational power to really use them. Um, it's a three-stage process, as you can see. So the uh, amount of computing involved both ways, the forward modeling part, the, the reverse modeling back from the seismic signals received at the surface, and then the correlation of the, the two together, that provides the final image. And I think just to give you an example of what that means, um, fairly low frequency data are easier to process as the, the smaller data sets. And you can see on the left, this example on the right with higher frequency data, which requires much more computational effort, but you can see much greater clarity in this seismic image. And that has really driven uh, the use of advanced uh, seismic imaging using GPUs. In this particular case, reverse time migration and what is called full waveform inversion, which is essentially an iterative version of, of, of RTM. Just to show you, this is the most recent list, the top 10 supercomputers worldwide. Two of them are used within the oil industry. Uh, one is in Italy, it's number eight, and the other one, number 10, is in Saudi Arabia. Uh, both of these machines are uh, used GPUs. Uh, HPC5 in Italy has over 7,000 of them, uh, Saudi Arabia over 8,000. They are the most powerful industrial supercomputers in the world. All of the others in that list are government machines used for research. So these two are the two most powerful industrial supercomputers worldwide, 
and they are primarily used for seismic imaging. The other side of this, not just the processing of the images, but then the ability to interpret them uh, to, to find oil and gas, um, that is to some extent constrained traditionally by the size of the machine, the size of the memory, the graphics card of a single, a single workstation. Uh, what we have been developing is essentially a scalable visualization uh, software. It's essentially a library that can be connected to uh, well-known applications. And that essentially is breaking up the, the seismic volume in this case into smaller cubes, which can be processed on different nodes, the same machine, and then assembled for the final uh, stage so that you have a complete uh, seismic image at the end. And this is scalable across multiple machines. So essentially you're not uh, restricted by the size of the data. The only restriction in, in fact is the number of these nodes which you have in this machine. Um, this has been used by companies like Shell for some time to do a 360 degree interpretation of seismic data at high resolution and, and full uh, 30 to 40 frames per second or higher. This is an example of, of what you can see, this, the, the level of sophistication of the graphics. Uh, you have uh, seismic uh, volume here, you have overlaid with height fields and slices, um, triangle meshes, wells, reservoir grids, all showing on the same image at high resolution and at, at interactive speeds. So the other side is virtualization. I won't dwell on this, but essentially this allows you to use the machine <clears throat> without specifically knowing the hardware. It'll basically set up a number of virtual machines for, for users to run both graphics and non-graphics applications. And we focus particularly on graphics because these are very uh, taxing uh, computationally. But the final thing is, is AI. Uh, this is something that can be applied right across the entire value chain, whether it's upstream, midstream or downstream. Uh, and there's many examples of this where a combination of high performance computing using simulation and AI can be used together to solve certain problems, whether these are those of prediction, predictive maintenance, inspection, logistics, etc. There's an example of this. And as I've said, we have built up libraries uh, for these particular purposes. Some of these, such as Metropolis, is used on the edge for things like video surveillance, where the main thing is zero latency. The, the system has to respond immediately, there's no delay. And what is needed to train AI models, which essentially requires a lot of computational power. So it's really indistinguishable from high performance computing. Exactly the same resources are needed. And finally, just to, to give some examples of where we're working and how we're applying this within the energy industry, a lot of this has to do with intelligent video, video analytics, where a GPU can be mounted inside a camera or inside a drone or an underwater UAV in order to be used for monitoring, surveillance, inspection, etc. And that is something where the device needs to be intelligent, intelligent and the, the GPU provides that intelligence. And that has to be done by essentially reinforcing the learning, uh, the AI that models which are within that GPU, whether these are being used to actually carry out a task, this is called inferencing, or for training those models, which are done back in the uh, computing center. And that is a continuous process. As this video is ingested um, more and more, uh, this whole system becomes more intelligent and able to predict anomalies, um, criminal activity, unusual behavior on um, filling station forecourts in this particular case, but it can be worked very widely applied. The second thing to do with the power industry is smart grids. As you know, renewables uh, involve input as well as output from a large power station, input from uh, wind turbines, from solar panels on people's houses. And this means you have a two-way grid and you have data which uh, is passed along this grid, essentially along the same topology as the, um, as the carrier itself. And of course, the need is to make sure that everything is, being, is running smoothly. No blackouts are going to happen. There are no uh, episodes where there's insufficient power or too much power and there's overload. 
Uh, this is the whole area of smart grids where AI is really going to be needed to, to solve these problems. They're very difficult to model uh, in a top-down fashion by traditional methods. Third area is energy transition. We are definitely interested in the, the energy mix, not only oil and gas, but the possibility of zero carbon generation of electricity um, from nuclear, either from fission or fusion, not today's reactors so much as tomorrow's, and the whole area of re renewables with wind and solar. And the final thing is the impact of 5G. Uh, that will affect uh, infrastructure by producing far higher bandwidth uh, flows of data which will require, again, the application of AI, both on the edge and at the main processing center that is controlling all this. And finally, the, the whole uh, thing of using virtual reality or augmented reality for training and safety, that is all part and parcel of the same architecture, uh, which can deliver all these different things under the, basically the, the, the heading of high performance computing. So where we're headed and where we believe the entire industry is headed is towards a kind of um, multi-tenant architecture, one that can accommodate bare metal supercomputing of the kind that I showed you earlier, but can also have part of it virtualized to allow a large number of people to work securely on different problems, large or small. Uh, these might be um, modeling AI use cases, training models, uh, and able to function securely within what is essentially a cloud environment using cloud um, uh, management tools such as Kubernetes, Slurm, things like that. So probably in the future, everything will be consumed in the cloud, in some kind of cloud. Uh, it won't belong to somebody or a small group of vendors. It will, it will be done in many cases by the customers themselves or by service providers who will provide that service as pretty much as it's done today as a, as a monthly fee. And that will solve one of the tricky problems, which is data sovereignty. How do you keep data secure? And how do you keep data in the region or certainly in the country uh, and not have it exported to other parts of the world? So this is um, really the, the future. Um, it's based on essentially the same high performance computing architecture and scalability but it's going to be used for all these different tasks, all of which are of key relevance to the, to the energy industry. As I showed earlier, I hope uh, the energy industry has been an early adopter of high performance computing. So that is all I have to, to say. I think I'm in time. So uh, Melvin, I'll pass it back to you if there's any questions. All right, Guy, thank you for your presentation. We'll check for some questions. Uh, just a second. Maybe they were listening to you carefully. Mm -hmm. right. So, not yet, sir. No questions. So, okay. what we will do is we'll, we'll go on to the next speaker. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much. And uh, we'd like to remind our attendees uh, to please participate in the contest and win those gifts. In the meantime, you can also visit the exhibition booths where all the products and services are there for you all to check out. Thank you, Mr. Guy. And hope thank to you see very you much. On, hope to see you, Roman, the next event. I hope so. Thank you. Uh, you be safe. Thank you very much. Bye bye.